The Tyranny of QWERTY by Charles Leckberg, and retyped by Tom Alderman slash W4BQF, How a Hundred-Year-Old Typing System Can Tangle Your Fingers and Waste Your Time. What can you say about a valuable, desperately needed skill that takes up to twice as long as it should to learn, takes up to twice as long as it should to use, makes you work perhaps 20 times harder than necessary, uses equipment booby trap to ensure errors, has persisted out of sheer inertia since 1872, is still being taught to millions of unsuspecting people? Well, you can't say much. The skill in question is typing, typing on QWERTY. QWERTY in case you've been using it for so long that you have forgotten what it is is the name for the standard typewriter keyboard. Q, W, E, R, T, and Y are the first six keys in the upper row of letters. Together they make up the traditional name for the keyboard. QWERTY even sounds faintly contemptible, and after you learn the facts, it is. Briefly, QWERTY came about this way. The first commercially practical typewriter was put together in Milwaukee through the work of C. Latham Scholes, Carlos Glidden, Samuel Soule, James Dinsmore, Matthias Schwalbach, and a few others. Scholes and his associates began with a device to number the pages of a book, and by 1867 created a rather crude machine that could make every man his own typesetter. This working model was first patented in 1868, went through many refinements, and was then turned over to Eremington and Sons, gunmakers, of Illion, New York, for manufacture in 1873. In their innocence Scholes and his partners first arranged the letters of the typewriter's keyboard in alphabetical order, but the uselessness of this system soon became apparent. Also, that particular model had mechanical problems. Type was suspended by wires in a small, circular nest inside the machine. You didn't have to type very fast for the letters to rise up and jam at the platen, the roller of a typewriter, the very place where they were supposed to print. To end that annoyance, James Densmo asked his son-in-law, a Pennsylvania school superintendent, who surely should have known what letters and combinations of letters appeared most often in the English language. Then, in 1872, Densmo Rand Scholes put what they believed to be the most used characters as far apart as possible in the type basket, and ended up with the horror of QWERTY. Since that time typewriters have become so refined mechanically that they almost operate themselves, the Kibo were designed in 1872, however, remains basically the same. Today you, and I and about 50 million other people in the English-speaking world still use QWERTY. Touch typing, in use almost from the very start, still has beginners thumping away, mumbling to themselves, a, uh, s, d, f, space, semicolon, l, k, j, space. Will it last forever? It could, for all us typers seem to care. And yet for 40 years since 1932 a logical alternative has been available but almost totally ignored. The world has hardly beaten a path to his door, but in 1932, after 20 years of study financed by two grants from the Carnegie Corporation, August of Orac came forth with a new typewriter keyboard. It was at Ream. On this keyboard you could type more than 3,000 words, on the familiar home row compared with perhaps only 50 on QWERTY's home row. Dvorak put all the vowels in his home row, under the fingers of the left hand. The right hand rested atop H, T and, and us, with D just to the left of the right index finger. QWERTYSJ and K, occupying the most prominent place, were banished to just about the least prominent on Dvorak's keyboard, and so on. Dvorak rearranged things so that 70% of the work could be done in the home row, 22% in the row, above, and 8% below. Numbers remained at the top, though in a different lineup, with QWERTY. 32% of the work is done in the home row, 52% above, and 16% below. Dvorak also made the right hand work harder, giving it 56% of the load, the left hand 44%. On QWERTY, the left hand had to handle 57% of the work, the right hand 43%. Dvorak also straightened out the workload of the separate fingers, and greatly reduced the clumsy stroking that almost guaranteed fatigue and errors. In his 538-page book Typewriter Behavior, Dvorak, then professor of education and director of research at the University of Washington in Seattle, described his work. 
he had studied thousands of words to discover the frequency of letters and letter combinations. He scrutinized finger movements with slow motion films of typists. And he tested more than 250 possible keyboards. One of his early conclusions was that you could come up with a better keyboard simply by arranging the letters at random a pretty strong condemnation of QWERTY. Dvorak, of course, was not the first or the last to try to improve.